Well, thanks for that introduction, and uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak today. So today, I want to, well, the, I was told this was about well, the intersection of safety and cybersecurity. So this is something we've been working on internally within Shell, and uh, it was top of mind. So I think this is what I'm going to talk about is where I believe that is a major intersection uh, between safety and, and cyber. So it's about managing the integrity of our safety barriers. And I'm gonna skip past that. <clears throat> yeah, so managing the integrity of our safety barriers and then where cybersecurity fits into that big picture. <clears throat> so um, it looks like this might be an older version, but we'll go with it. So I wanna talk about uh, the risk from a big picture point of view. So <clears throat> yeah, this is definitely an older version. This is not the latest version that I get sent. Um, do you have the, the one I sent on set? Yeah. Um, is it available? Do you have it? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll talk through this slide and then see if you can find it, because I think there was some changes. But um, so there's three buckets of risk that I wanted to talk about. The first one is um, risk of top events. And so that's where uh, HSSC, uh, the, the HSSC risk management process focuses on. And that's basically the bad things that can happen to uh, our people, our environment, our assets, <clears throat> and our community. And, um, and, and that, that's uh, generally rolled up into what we call HSSC, HSSC risk. It may be rolled up further into what we generally call safety risk. The other category is risk to um, our, you know, our business loss, and, uh, and that's related to loss of dollars, you know, loss of services or products or interruption of service or products to our customers. That's generally rolled up into you know, non-safety related risk. Third category is where I want to talk about and elaborate more on the presentation, and uh, that's related to uh, how we manage our top events, which is that first, kind of related back to that first category. Top events are managed by selecting safety barriers to reduce the likelihood and, you know, and severity of consequences uh, to our top events. And uh, <clears throat> so I'll get, I'll get more into that, and I think that's where cybersecurity fits in, uh, because our safety barriers that we're picking definitely have cyber vulnerabilities, and are a subset of them do, and how we need to manage that. Yeah, this is... Uh, Okay. Yeah, so, so a couple of definitions um, that I'm going to use in the presentation. So a hazard, um, you know, that's, that's uh, uh, you know, a, a hazard is, is something that can, that can be uh, released and, and cause a significant safety, you know, safety event. And, uh, and then top events, um, I'll use the definition, I'll use the term top event throughout the presentation. And uh, top event, that's, that's the, that's the re release of the hazard that, and, and the hazards could be things like, you know, hydrocarbons, toxic substances, uh, energy, uh, objects at height. And then I'll use the term ALARP uh, as, lo as low as reasonably practicable. And uh, so that's a couple of definitions. Yep, this is it. 
So I'll back up just a little bit. So I didn't have this agenda item in there before. So again, I talked about the risk from a big picture, but uh, also I'm gonna also talk about the HSSC risk management process. Uh, a one-on-one, highly, you know, really simplified, because I think as a cybersecurity community, you know, we need to understand the terminology and, and the basics of the risk of the HSSC risk management process, because our challenge is, you know, where does cybersecurity fit into that? Again, a, the, the couple of definitions, you know, hazard, a better definition of a hazard, agent with potential to cause harm, talked about top of it in ALARP, the risk big picture, again, we have our risk of top events, we talked about that, safety, risk of business losses, generally non-safety, <clears throat> and then I'll focus on the risk of barrier integrity reduction. And that's about how do we manage the integrity of the safety barriers that we pick to manage our top events. So <clears throat> a high level view of the, of the process includes a few phases. So the first one is hazard identification. So we talk about you know, the output of our hazard and hazard process, which is identifying and fully understanding our hazards and our top events. Mark, can you just step a little bit closer to the mic? Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. I'm usually, with the, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the next phase is uh, risk analysis. That's where we, we identify our likelihoods and our severity of consequences for the top events that have been identified. And then the next category is uh, go through a risk reduction exercise where we select our barriers. And uh, the barriers <clears throat> reduce the, um, so for example, control barriers reduce the likelihood of the occurrence of the top event. And recovery barriers contribute to the reducing likelihood but focus on reducing the severity of the consequences of the top event. And then all this analysis is rolled up and documented in what we call a safety case or an HSSC case. And then that's typically handed off to a regulator, you know, for approval, and then we're off to operate our asset. <clears throat> now one thing to note here is that historically sabotage has not been you know accounted for in this in this process. And cybersecurity you know tends to fall in that sab that, that sabotage category, although not totally. So this slide, I'm just kind of squashing three of these phases in, into one slide, introduce a couple of uh, tools that's used. Uh, so again, the first step, identify hazards and top events. And then we use a, a risk assessment matrix in the next step, which is we rank the unmitigated likelihood of the, of the top event, and we rank the uh, unmitigated severity of the consequence of the top events. And that's using your company's, you know, risk assessment matrix. Uh, this is a very, showing a, a very simplified version of one. Uh, it has m much more detail than the actual. And then the ne next step is selecting control barriers that reduce the, uh, the frequency of the top events. And this is important to both tolerable and ALARP levels. And there's another slide on how we get to there, get there. And then the next step, selecting our recovery barriers to reduce the severity, uh, of primarily the severity of the top events. Now this analysis can be um, you know, shown visually in a bow time model. <clears throat> Probably most folks are familiar with bow time models. And uh, one of the key features of the bow time model is initiating events. So we ha you identify threats and so forth in this process, but an initiating event is what causes a threat to be realized and then could lead to the top event if your control barrier is not effective. Now initiating events, uh, there's you know, a few main categories, external events, uh, equipment failure, and human failure. External events would be like earthquakes, fires, floods, and sabotage, again, which is where cybersecurity fits in. And then secondly, machine, machine failures would include both software and hardware failures, uh, software, you know, bugs, logic errors. Um, then you have component failures. Uh, then machinery, you know, corrosion, wear, vibration, etc. And then human failure, you know, operator error, maintenance error, maybe some other categories. I don't know where I'm supposed to point. It was working. Yeah, it's not working. Can you advance one? There it goes. So on this slide, I'm going to talk about LOPA. Not, not that we need to understand LOPA, but it, it's, a, uh, it's one of the tools in the set of tools that are used in the HSSE risk management process. And what I want to demonstrate here is that it's uh, 
semi-quantitative to quantitative type of tool, and there's even other tools that are even more quantitative. But I think on the cybersecurity side of the fence and our risk assessment tools, we tend to be lumped over on the qualitative side. And, um, and, and also introduce the idea of the company tolerability, company tolerability criteria table, which supports this process. And within Shell, we have this table. It's filled out with all its detail, and it's, it's available in a document. And uh, so the way this goes <clears throat> is the output of your, your hazard and hazard process is you identify, among other things, initiating events. And those events have frequencies associated with them. And then with, with the, uh, the unmitigated um, frequency of your top event is basically equal to the frequency of your top event. Then the top event has been rated with a people severity of five. So then you go to your tolerability criteria table, you look up, you look across at your target frequency you're, you want to get to with such a severity, which in this case is once every 100,000 years. Now our, our un, unmitigated frequency is once every five years. So how do we get there? Well, we, we go through a process of selecting independent barriers. And so these barriers, um, independent in the sense that they don't have a common mode failure. So uh, the process also includes, you know, picking barriers that have, I would say, proven risk reduction factors associated with them. So in this case, we have two non-safety instrumented function barriers both of which have a risk reduction factor associated with 10. When you run the numbers, you're not at your target frequency yet. So then we add in a safety instrumented function. Now we need to build that safety instrumented function with a quality or let's say an integrity level um, of 200 to get to our target frequency of, one, of once in 100,000 years. Now that, that's related to a seal table. So you look in your seal table, well, we need, to, we need to build it to a seal level two in order to claim a risk, risk reduction factor of 200. So again, that's just a quick, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll try to stick to it. Okay, I think I'm good. Um, so anyway, th th not, to, not that we need to understand this thoroughly, but this just demonstrates that there's a semi-quantitative to quantitative analysis going on here. There's a, it's supported by a tolerability criteria table. And you know, do, does your company have, <clears throat> have a table like this that supports a cybersecurity risk assessment? And the last step in this process is, is um, you know, once we get to a tolerable level of residual risk in this process, then the team needs to ask one more question. Can any additional barriers be justified based on cost and further risk reduction achieved? And so if the answer is yes, then, um, then you add that to your design and you can call it a day and, and you've, you're, and so you're at a LARP, you have an ALARP solution. <clears throat> So where does cybersecurity fit in? So there's a, there's a few things here that, that can be used as input into a cybersecurity risk assessment process. And, th and this ideally needs to be right on the heels of this or partial or even integrated into the HSC risk management process. So looking at initiating events. <clears throat> so the BPCS is actually a common source of initiating events and that can, it's been proven that can be manipulated by a cyber threat actor. And, and there's many other types of initiating events that a subset of which, you know, could be, you know, caused by a cyber threat actor. So, so analyzing that and then figuring out, okay, what controls do we need to, you know, cyber security controls we need to put in place to manage that. And then your control and recovery barriers, you know, your safety related control and recovery barriers. I think one other point I wanted to make earlier on those, on those bow ties related to managing our type events, I haven't yet seen a cyber security control make it into that barrier list. Um, those are things like pressure relief valves, you know, buns around uh, tanks, um, you know, your safety instrument system, for example, and even things like collision avoidance radar, firewater pumps, things like that. <clears throat> so, uh, it, and then the other point here is increasingly the set of barriers that are available to be picked to manage our type events have compute software network components and bringing with that cyber vulnerabilities. So this is gonna be increasingly important as time goes on. You know, with digitalization, this is an opportunity to bring in digitalization and IOT. So as that comes along and, and, and this becomes more prominent, then uh, you know, that's gonna bring with it some cyber vulnerabilities. So again, the challenge here is, is to integrate a cybersecurity risk assessment you know, into our HSSC risk assessment process. 
So the next section, I'm going to bring up the con or introduce the concept of escalation factor, which is where I think the rubber meets the road on this. So this is an extension of the bow time model. <clears throat> so escalation factors are situations, conditions, or circumstances uh, that may lead to the partial or full failure of a barrier. And, and so these escalation factors are reducing the integrity of the barrier. And if you reduce the integrity of your safety barriers, then the likelihood of the type of event goes up, possibly beyond, certainly above ALARP, possibly beyond your tolerable levels of, uh, of risk. So an example here would be a safety instrument of function. Escalation factor would be unauthorized trip setting change. And then a, a possible control would be you know, rigorous access controls for your CIS. Now escalation factors, it's part of the model. It's part of what HSSC understands. <clears throat> the, the folks that do the HSSC risk management process. And cybersecurity is just one more category of escalation factors. There's lots of other categories of factors. You know, mechanical devices have their own set of escalation factors that can affect their integrity. But in this case, we need to identify the, the control and recovery barriers you know, that have cyber vulnerabilities and look at it from an escalation factor point of view and then figure out what our controls will be. And our controls fit in that green box on this model. So our cybersecurity controls would fit in that green box called escalation factor controls. And again, the advantage of this is that we're using HSSC terminology, and as we want to integrate cybersecurity risk assessment into that, talking the same language, I think, is a big benefit. So another point here is that we talk about SIS a lot, you know, safety instrumented systems and cyber vulnerabilities related to that. But there's many other types of safety barriers. <clears throat> so this is an ex a list I pulled in from internally. You know, fire water pumps are an example of a recovery barrier. You know, offshore we had a presentation about maritime <clears throat> and ships. You know, navigation aids, collision avoidance systems. Those are taken credit for, and are associated with risk reduction related top events of like a collision, right? Um, and so there's many other examples of that. So it's not just a CIS. We have to expand our thinking beyond just a CIS. And again, I think this trend will continue into the future as more of these safety barriers that we can pick from, again, have cyber, cyber vulnerabilities. And, uh, and yeah, so the challenge is, you know, how do we, how do we get this cybersecurity risk assessment, you know, integrated into our, our HSSC risk assessment process? Now, this is supported by the industry. Um, so the functional safety standard, uh, 61511 now has a requirement to do a, a security risk assessment for the SIS. It goes on to say that this, this assessment can be expanded to the entire automation solution. So while you're at it, you can do that and create your cybersecurity requirement specification for the entire solution. And again, pointing out that you know, there's potentially many other safety critical systems beyond just the SIS that you should be analyzing. So the concept of a, you know, a cyber PHA has emerged in the industry. Uh, we're starting to hear a lot about that. And uh, that's supported by the external standards you know, that's documented in, in some of these documents, 62443 Part 3-2, uh, the ISA TR84 report. It's a very nice uh, description of the process. And Yamura has a report that's uh, related to this as well. So, so these are some documents that can support the process. And, and there may be others. So this is another scenario that I think is worth looking at, uh, common mode failure. In theory, the barriers that are picked in the HSSC risk assessment process are verified to be independent from one another. There's no common mode failure. But when you factor in sabotage, like cybersecurity, well, you could have common mode failure across you know, two or more of the barriers. In this case, I'm showing uh, two non-SIF barriers, which are actually implemented in the BPCS, which is operator alarm with response and then the BPS, BPCS controller. We know, those, we know these things are implemented software, they're networked, et cetera, has cyber vulnerabilities. And the same thing with the safety instrumented function. <clears throat> An example of this would be like Tricon, TriSys scenario that was, you know, that we, we've talked about multiple times today. But the idea would be that, that the, uh, the attacker came in, put malware on the safety instrumented function, which in theory disables that function. Then so, so, you know, we think possibly the objective was to pivot over to the BPCS and then attempt to manipulate that into triggering an initiating event. And then that would cause a demand on the SIF, which would not work. 
and then that could lead to the top event if you don't have any other barriers in place. So another thing to consider about looking at, looking at all your barriers. And lastly, um, I guess I'm probably about out of time with the delays, but uh, safety case, uh, kind of reiterate, reiterate on the safety case that this is documented, I think, as cybersecurity practitioners uh, at assets. We need to be familiar with our asset safety case. Know your initiating events that's, that have been documented. Understand your control and recovery barriers, making sure you're doing risk assessment on that from a cyber point of view and putting in the right controls. I think I'll quit there. Thanks.